Good morning, everyone. Today I will be presenting uh, the, this presentation uh, about interpreting Lenner through the lens of the structured data model. The main points of the presentation will be that we postulate that the nuclear transmutation is the principal cause for the observed phenomena, such as the excess heat shown in many Lenner experiments. Our position is that the structured data model, SAM, for short, developed over the last seven years, brings new insight not available in any of the existing models of the nucleus, as uh, uh, explained by late Norman Cook, including a plausible explanation of the physics behind those sort of transmutations. So this presentation is a look at some of those random results in general through the lens of SAM. Uh, I'm not going to go into details like previous years. I refer to these resources and all the links and material can be found on the bold uh, website that we have on top. Main points from SAM, just a re quick recap. In SAM, the neutron is no longer a fundamental particle, the same on the same level as the proton. It is a proton-electron pair, or PEP for short, a combination. So I will be using neutron and PEP in term mingling. The nucleus consists therefore of protons and inner nu nuclear electrons. The inner electrons act as a glue binding the protons together. The deuteron is the basic building block in SAM, so instead of an alpha particle model, you could say it's a deuteron particle model. The protons aided by the inner electrons create geometrical structures based on rules of circle dense packing. So when we take a look there, can we? Okay, that's not working. Ah, I'll continue. So, looking at the elements, which I was just about to show you in a nice animation, we can see here spread out through the periodic table with all the de defined uh, structures of the elements. The benefits of SAM. SAM has at least two benefits in relation to the field of Lenner. First, it's showing the mechanism of traditional nuclear fission correctly, and to our knowledge, that is the only atomic model that can do that, meaning explaining the asymmetric breakup of the nucleus. The second point is, that the fact, is the fact that we can identify relatively positive and relatively negative spots on the nucleus, in effect making the nucleus polarized, somewhat similar like water, which can explain the fusion of hydrogen to a metal and even as an extension spallation or fission uh, reactions. So charge distributions in the SAM nuclei are anisotropic, so charge is distributed unevenly in the nucleus. The splitting of the atom breaking of the branches which you see here, this is the conventional uh, 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 information. On the left we see the 90 to 100 AMU range, and on the right we see the 130 to 140 AMU range. And take note, there is no 50-50 split. On the right side, the picture, I will show that here. So the heavy component is more or less steady, and we say there are two branches breaking off, if you will, forming the lighter component part on the left, and that does change. So to show, us, uh, show it in a reaction, if you will, we add a, a pack or neutron to the uranium, it uh, a, a absorbs it, but in the center, you can see here, where several branches are coming too close for comfort. They come together, they fuse in a very neat way, structurally sound, but as a result, at the bottom they break off. Collectively, these two branches break off, which you can see on the right here with this arrow going down, causing the lighter component. And the remaining part is the heavier component, which in turn offers a few more PEPs or neutrons to make the cycle complete. So the nucleus is polarized. The structure of the nucleus dictates locations on which is shown, on which uh, show different grades of positivity. So on the top right there with the arrow here, this is where the relatively positive endings, where the valence electron connectors of the nucleus are residing. So chemistry, if you will. That's where the chemistry connection is made. Um, so this is where the relatively negative neutrons want to go to. That's where they reside and land on to. Then we have relatively negative spots where a neutron is already added, becoming quite negatively, at least relative. So those are the yellow spheres that you see here, where I've added two neutrons. This one is essential for the structure. This one on the left is optional. And we can add more, obviously. So the main body of the nucleus is white-greenish, which is a normal ratio of two to one, 
uh, two to one, meaning two protons, one inner electron. Um, what we call proton capture, or fusion of hydrogen into a metal, is kind of like the reverse of a neutron capture. A neutron, as I just explained, can land on the nucleus. But if there's already a neutron, a proton only needs to be added there. And then it works. But as we can see in the center here, as I mentioned, this location is not structurally sound, meaning there's a response, and the response is spallation or fission. So what we're saying is that heavy isotopes should be receptive to that. So let's take a look at a few Lennon results that subscribe to this idea. Uh, transmutation seems to us is to be the key, meaning that the underlying mechanism that causes the observed extra energy release, such as heat. And I'm going to go through a few examples, from Mizuno, Stankovic, and Osama. Uh, Mizuno already in 1998 reached the conclusion based on his own experiments, whereby he found a whole range of lighter elements, which you can see on the picture on the right, which, and you get elements such like uh, uh, potassium, calcium, manganese, iron, but also fluorine, oxygen, carbon, etc., etc., totally depending on the source material, including what isotope I'm offering. So his conviction was strong enough to, to give the book a subtitle, The Reality of Cold Fusion. Uh, results seem to indicate fission as well as fusion of hydrogen to metals, and he found even, he even found shifts in the isotopic uh, data which we see here. I'm not going to go into details, but it's quite clear that in relation to the depth, the different isotopes, of in this case palladium, actually change. So what gives? What's going on? The lightest one, where the laser pointer is pointing uh, towards the surface, is actually increasing and other ones are decreasing. So we need an explanation there. Fusion of hydrogen with palladium. First, I'm going to show you here uh, the more or less stable options. So we take a palladium 105 plus hydrogen, become a silver 106, which is not stable, and we'll beta decay back to a palladium 106, meaning the creation of 106 palladium, and therefore it increases, at least relatively. But if I take a 106 plus a hydrogen, I get a 107 silver, which is totally stable, and a 108 similar with the silver 109. Um, then, uh, as, a, as another possibility, which was mentioned in the previous presentation, if it lands on the wrong spot, meaning the structure is suddenly not sound anymore, we get something like this, the palladium 104 plus a hydrogen becoming a silver 105, and then you get, for example, this is just an example, this can totally change, a scandium 45 and a nickel 60, or in the case of palladium 110, we get a silver 111, and you could get, for example, three parts of it, kind of like the standard fission of uranium. Stankovic, a couple of years ago, in 2019, he presented something there which is called oxygen capture, whereby he used an oxyhydrogen flame with many radicals, as already pointed out, on a carbon target which was quite, poor, quite pure, and the results were an overabundance of silicon, hard to ignore. So the reactions you see here, a carbon 12 plus an oxygen 16 would be a silicon 28. In order to verify that, we are, uh, have a, uh, several experiments lined up with about 12 metals to redo this and expand our knowledge about it. Then uh, Osawa, in 1964 already, they had an experiment with a closed chamber. They ionized a little bit of sodium in it. Then they added the equivalent molar equivalent of oxygen to it. And as the descriptions you can see here, that the color of the, uh, what was it, the red, um, the sodium yellowish orange uh, turned into the red purple of potassium instantly, pretty much. So here we see the reaction using the structured data model again, whereby we see the sodium plus the oxygen turning into the potassium. So what is it really? Summarizing these findings and putting them together, I would say that the Lennar phenomenon is based on actual fusion of a hydrogen up to an oxygen, not much more probably because it will become uh, too difficult to resettle in a proper way, meaning you get fission again. So this is the cause for either stable outcome, a beta decay transmutation, or even fission. In other words, the Lennar is, as the name suggests, low energy input, high energy, high energy output based on nuclear reactions, beta decay and fission, or spallation, if you prefer. All these reactions are in essence exothermic, and secondary and even tertiary reactions could be expected. So due to the inherent chaotic nature of fission, 
one can imagine a highly energetic uh, environment in a metal that you can get all kinds of uh, combinations. Um, and the, the, all kinds of reactions of fission products would be expected, as pointed out during the conference already. So the sample shows that the breaking off of the branches, we would expect certain elements or ranges of to dominate as an outcome for specific starting elements. There is a multitude of mechanisms that can lead to this phenomenon. We are all aware of that. Hydrogen capture is probably but one of them, and oxygen capture as well, and everything in between. A metal in contact with a hydrogen loading, the confused the mechanism is obviously debatable. And perhaps there is more than one mechanism, as I pointed out. The fusing of hydrogen up to oxygen to a metal, whereby the metal represents a base on which uh, pieces of nuclei can be fused onto, and as mentioned, lead to all kinds of reactions. Now, regardless of the mechanism, already in 1938, people were quite astonished whereby, uh, and I'll read the quote here, uh, according to Frisch in 1938, was it a mistake? No, said Lisa Meitner, Hahn was too good a chemist for that. But how could barium be formed from uranium? No larger fragments and protons or helium nuclei, alpha particles, had ever been chipped away from nuclei. And to chip off a large number, not nearly enough energy was available. The charge of a uranium nucleus we found was indeed large enough to overcome the effect of the surface tension almost completely. So the uranium nucleus might indeed resemble a very wobbly, unstable drug, ready to divide itself, to divide itself at the slightest provocation, such as the impact of a single neutron, and in this case, I'm explaining how a proton might even do that. So following Sherlock Holmes' thinking, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the possible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth? And I believe that's what we're looking at collectively. So what we could be seeing, proton capture on heavy isotopes, many times not the lighter one of the specific element, and instead of neutrons, uh, instead of neutrons captured by the nuclei. An extra neutron connects to the offered proton, which could could be the mechanism for opening the so-called Coulomb barrier. And on the right, we see already there a proton offered to a boron-11, which turns into uh, a boron-11 obviously has one extra uh, uh, neutron, heavier isotope, turning into a carbon-12. So we see that's where the proton goes to. So how to strengthen these ideas? In the near future, we hope to work together with other parties with a two-fold goal. The demonstration of an actual Leonard-based device that performs work right, without any dispute, while providing an explanation of the processes using SAM. We are cooperating in some key commercial and academic labs to move this theory to more practical applications and experiments, as I mentioned before, lined up that strengthen the theoretical explanation that transmutations, regardless of the exact uh, nuclear reaction, as explained, explained in this presentation, are the key underlying cause for Leonard. So understanding that the structure of the nucleus gives insight and can be used to obtain more detailed information about fusion and fission processes that are seen in these experiments. The actual mechanism is, in our opinion, not fully understood and is held back, I would argue, by conventional thinking. We try to unravel the secret of the nucleus from a structural point of view, an engineering point of view, if you will, meaning observing what nuclear reactions can take place under which circumstances. And we think this is one way forward and will lead in the end, to an actual breakthrough. Oh, for an extra. No. So, concluding, the nucleus is polarized, just like water. The isotopes of the elements with the extra neutrons can capture protons and deuterons, etc. And this is falsifiable. We can do these experiments to check if it's really the case or not. Then, I believe one of the most important uh, preliminary conclusions, or hypothesis if you will, that stable heavy elements in principle can be made to fission through Lenner fusion, which is falsifiable. So I'm personally convinced that this community actually stumbled on that potential mechanism. So we could fuse a whole bunch more elements, uh, fission a whole bunch more elements than just uranium, for example. The structure, which is the whole point here, reveals these things to us, useful things that can help us in this wonderful field of research. Lena. So, that was that. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we have time for a few questions, by the way. Okay, thank you, Adolf, for this beautiful presentation, indeed. And we discussed that already uh, last year or even two years ago. 
when we look at the table of the con how you construct the nuclei of all elements, there is a surprising similarity with the table constructed according to the chemical, uh, let's say, properties. Uh, can you expand between the, why there is such a similarity between the structure of the nucleus and the chemical properties, maybe? Okay, excellent question. I didn't go into the detail. We did touch upon that a few years ago, a couple of times. But in short, what we're saying is that the structure of the nucleus, as I explained, more positive, more relatively negative spots, etc., that is where the electrons from another atom connect to, electrostatically, chemical bond. And now, of course, there's a lot of variation there. But so, in conclusion to your answer, the structure of the nucleus actually dictates the outer electron realm, whatever and however that may be the case. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Thank you very much, Ida, for an excellent presentation. Um, I agree with you that um, the use of HHO is um, a very important process. Uh, a couple of years ago, I said actually most or a good proportion of Lena can be replicated by HHO. It doesn't matter whether it's Martin Fleischmann, uh, Mizuno, uh, it's essentially HHO, and it's the fast track to studying this. I so we're in agreement. Uh, and I'm glad that you've identified the sort of curvature and transmutations that Stankovic referred to in ICF, ICCF in, in Azizi in 2000, uh, ICCF 22. Are you working with him? Yes, that is the intention for those 12 metals that I mentioned. In principle, to redo his experiment, right? That's what we need to do. And expand it with a whole bunch of more metals so we can increase our knowledge of actually what element, what isotope fuses with what. Basically, simply following the observations. That's what we need to do first. And then we need to, of course, go back to the model and do a whole lot of thinking and explaining. And that is, of course, the challenge. Perfect, Dido. I'm so happy to see this work. I said in 2021, it, uh, HHO is Lena in a can, and if people want a fast track to understand this, they just need an electrolyzer and a burner and a flashback suppressor. And that one is just about ready to go, so... Awesome. Soon. Okay. Any more questions? We have a few moments. Thanks to the impressive speed with which Edo got through his presentation. <laughs>